and welcome to our penultimate session of the VID21 conference. My name is Julia Steele. I'm the creator and host and we've made it to the second to last session after almost 73 sessions I think we're up to now. So uh, thank you so much for joining us and for watching this recording if you're watching the playback. Um, in this session we are joined by the incredible Dr. Janine Bikusen, OAM. Um, Janine is a futurist who believes existing structures in the technology industry must change in order to serve tomorrow's digital landscapes and that our children's future job prospects depend on it. Her focus is on leadership, innovation and education to champion Australian tech entrepreneurship and address the necessary rebalancing of gender roles within traditional male dominated STEM roles. In highlighting in a highly illuminating presentations, Janine discusses her vision with Australia's future in technology, including the changes that will prove critical in helping leaders break traditional approaches that currently hold us back. More importantly, she proposes practical solutions that can mobilize a new generation of leaders and innovators who are committed to solving real world problems with technology. Um, thank you so much, Janine. I've been looking forward to this conversation all week because I'm a tech head, really. I'm a nerd. You know me. I love what you do. <laughs> Thank you put all this off you pulled all of this off you've built this platform you've made this happen two years in a row now you're a bit of a hero thank you so much i uh we're going to start with your story and um you know a bit of mine and and you know i started out doing computer science and grew up in high school probably the only girl in my design and technology class at the time so uh let's start with your story and i know that we'll have some people joining that are uh, in the stem the STEM area um, that are women as well. So uh, let's start with your story and we can see where we go. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for the opportunity. And hi, everyone. I'm Janine or Juella as my superhero alter ego. So I have a cape, which we have many capes. <laughs> Very important. You can never have too many capes. But I guess the idea of a cape is, um, and it's the idea of a super superhero where I am at this point in my life, and I'll work backwards, is, you know, being a superhero is not about being good at everything. It's about finding that one thing that you're good at that makes you different, that makes you awesome. And I think we all have a superpower inside of us. And if nothing else in the last 12 months, we've probably found out what that is. And um, uh, I'm often asked what mine is. And I say that it's my smile because it's almost physically impossible for someone to frown at you if you smile at them. So next time someone's frowning at you, put your hands on your hips. It's great for girls particularly. I love talking to kids about this. Um, give them a big smile and see how they react. So, you know, life's not easy, and I'm sure we all know that right now more than ever. I mean, Brisbane lockdown as we speak, and certainly I'm doing totally okay. Um, but we've all been, I guess, challenged um, in terms of our resilience, particularly over the last 12 months. And that's, I guess, a theme for my life. So, in some ways, I feel like I was in some ways prepared for COVID in terms of having resilience and needing to pull that out um, in probably the toughest year of most people's lives. And um, so, I guess my story. It often starts when I was five. Um, my father passed away when I was five. And I guess I grew up in low SES um, housing commission. Um, my mother had to do a number of jobs to kind of keep things going after that. And I guess it was a very challenging start to life, um, not having a role model um, in my dad, I guess, and not having that access to someone, um, a male leader, I guess, and having no male siblings. Um, and I guess that taught me to be independent, <laughs> tough lesson to learn, but it did. Um, and I look back on that and it, I had to find my own way, I guess, because my sister was much older and other things going on and I was kind of left to my own devices, I guess. So that did teach me a lot in life now looking back. And though not that it was a good thing that happened, but I certainly learned a lot out of the experience. And, you know, I, 
I like school. I loved reading. I love reading still. I have literally six books around me. I've got audible books. I've got ebooks going all at the same time. I love to read. And I think reading is such a great escape. And for me as a young person, it was a great escape to find these, you know, far off lands that I never even dreamed that I would be able to, I guess, visit. Um, you know, the thing we used to do called travel. Um, I never thought that was a thing when I was young. And then I experienced it very fortunately. But um, yeah, I can remember what that was like. And so, yeah, I guess um, storytelling, I think, is something I've always loved. Problem solving is something that I love. Um, and I was fortunate my mother did invest in technology quite early. So I did get to tinker a lot with technology, you know, the new VCR. I remember getting to record that and things and having, you know, the remote control that went to the other room. And so I'd be in my bedroom and go, oh, I can just record from here. And how cool was this kind of technology playing around? I remember my first computer. It was, you know, an old um, green screen computer that had a tape deck that would make weird noises at you. And I remember playing this game called Snowball. It was the only game we had and it was like text-based. And I think we had to they said it would take like 100 hours to finish this game I remember and it was like what that's just outrageous and now if you go on Steam or something and it tracks how many hours you've spent on there it's like how many thousands of hours you could see things and it tells you things you don't want to know but yeah it was a big deal at the time so I guess I you know like to tinker um had lots of little handheld games and things like that and just thought technology was fascinating um I did okay at school I was a bit distracted to be honest I don't think it was necessarily something that met all of my needs looking back um so I didn't give my full effort um but certainly I did enjoy computers and there was a moment when I think back so I was in year eight and I was in a computer class there was three girls all boys and we had these old um they were like Sperry computers they were again the green screens um dot matrix printers basically all the boys would come in and just steal all the parts out of them they'd steal the ram and stuff they thought that was a cool thing to do whereas us three girls we were like we actually wouldn't mind learning something so i've had a pretty insightful teacher who put the three of us in a different lab um, on our own with no teacher no supervision in year eight so us three girls got to do that um and we had these brand new apple mac computers i remember they were like the all in one the the leases i think that the apple twos and we had this brand new printer which was like this laser printer that printed like you know perfect copy and color and it was like this ten thousand dollar thing which was a big deal for the high school that i went to and i remember we were given free reign and there was just something about looking back that moment giving us the freedom and the leadership opportunity where we could have misbehaved but of course we didn't because we were like wow this is amazing first of all we heard of the guys who were just misbehaving it themselves we got to learn stuff and on our own and it was such a great experience so um i mean those and i've written a book recently five things you can do to engage girls in stem and one of the things is actually to give girls opportunities for, for leadership, I guess, um, which was not something that happened at my school, really, and certainly for someone like me who wasn't a top student. Um, yeah, so I think those little things shape you, teachers shape you, importantly. I've certainly had some favourite teachers at school and tried to now pass that on. Um, you know, didn't know what I wanted to do when I finished school. It wasn't sort of didn't get the right scores and things. So what do you do? I washed cars, <laughs> I worked in supermarkets. So I did also do telemarketing. I did all sorts of crazy things. Um, and then I just one day thought, if I'm going to get ahead, I probably need to get educated. And so it was like, okay, let's go and study. So I went to TAFE. I went to South Bank TAFE, which was amazing. I did a diploma of business. Um, I didn't get into university because my scores weren't that great from school. So I had to have a bit of a stepping stone. And in a way, I'm grateful because I learned so much in that business course. Like I did a couple of IT subjects and I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. I mean, the desktop publishing was a thing. And I was like, oh, this is fun. And even just being able to use like Microsoft Access and databases in Excel in a really sophisticated way back a long time ago now, 23 years ago or something. I was just like, this is pretty cool. And so, yeah, taking those skills, going, oh, I could do business, but I'll probably be bored just because I want something that's going to keep growing, where IT was starting to be a thing and I got to pull computers apart. And thought, this is pretty fun. And I tinkered, I like to tinker, I like to problem solve. So, yeah, I did the diploma, went to university, um, got into the IT degree, nearly quit in my first year. Um, I did program in assembly code, which was just like, this is a world away from anything I've ever dreamt that I would have to do in my life. Um, half the class cheated, I think, because it was just so challenging and taught very badly. Um, but fortunately, I had a, a lecturer, a male lecturer, who taught information systems. And I realised this is an intersection of technology, people and organisations. What a great thing, there's people involved in technology. So for me, that was a real turning point going, well, okay, well, people involved, maybe I can do this thing. So after nearly quitting, I went on and I ended up having a couple of, a number of female lecturers who were just amazing as role models, 
who are basically responsible for the tech girls work that I do today. They started back in 1997. They had a grant for women in tech to understand the lucky numbers of women. So this is a very long time ago. I joined their team in 2000 and I guess they were grooming me to take over, which is maybe not a bad thing. They're now retired, but it's, um, yeah. Now I have the best job in the world, to be honest. I don't know how I got here, to be honest. I think it's Janine 4.0. I think I've lived three lives, which I didn't expect to leave two of them, let alone now I get into my fourth. But amazing adventures. And yeah, I think it just shows hard work pays off. Caring about stuff pays off. And um, just being a kind person and trying to make the world a better place. So much of your story echoes mine. I can think I've got very clear memories, a couple of different points in primary school and high school where I just remember, you know, being more interested in tech and maths and you know, wouldn't, didn't know it as tech at the time, but even just things like um, being in maths and what I now know is programming a mouse to go, you know, to navigate through a maze. I didn't know, I thought it was fun at the time didn't know that we were actually learning programming at the oh, early form of programming at the time. Um, I remember taking a go-kart to pieces and putting it back together because um, I thought that was fun. And you know, there's just so many things that you were saying. And I actually, through most of high school, wanted to be a physiotherapist and didn't get the science, um, didn't get the chemistry score that I needed. And uh, it was mid nineties. And so I went to do business and very similar to what you just what you just said, I did business and then I was like, well, business and what? And I was like, okay, well, I've always been interested in, in technology. So I did business and, and business and IT. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember being kind of weirded out by the really nerdy stuff. I think I was, um, my programming class looked like Steve Jobs' garage. It was just, <laughs> just uh, yeah, a bit too nerdy. But as soon as I found that sweet spot in the people organization and, and technology space, I really, really sort of, found my found my uh my love and passion really and have, have gone from there in a, in a similar way to you when you look at what you're doing with tech girls now and so let's look and and particularly nurturing the next generation of, of young girls into the workforce um in and in, in into stem roles what have you seen evolve because we talk about our time as the 90s right but then that i saw changes in 2010 and now in 2021 how have you seen that evolve in your in your time phenomenally to be honest I think some things change a lot and some things don't change at all I think like most things in life um to be honest I would not want to be growing up in an Instagram world I don't well I, I can't imagine how challenging that is for young people particularly young people who don't feel like they fit in or even those that do I think it puts so much pressure on them as well to be certain things so I think there's that you know, Instagram perfect idea of the world, which is so false. And I, I think that's actually quite damaging for our young people. So I think technology is often used not so much for good um, in that way, in terms of, you know, Instagram, you know, Facebook and elections and all sorts of things we know about. So, uh, you know, AI for good, AI for bad, there's so many double-edged swords. I think we're at a point where we have to make some really serious decisions about where we want to go with technology in the future, particularly around AI and the bias that we build into technology like that. Um, and seeing how that's changed, um, I th you know what, we used to talk about STEM and we need girls in STEM. Firstly, we don't have to talk about that anymore. So that's actually a really nice step forward. I've been talking about this for 21 years now. I'm pretty happy to not have to have that conversation anymore. We've <laughs> definitely come forward from there. So that, that's a bonus. Um, now with particularly what's happening in our country right now and the, the discussions about the importance of having women's voices heard, uh, I think now's a great opportunity for us and our girls to really shine and to shine a light on the work that we've done because that's what our girls are doing every day. They're sharing their voices with ideas that they care about and solutions to problems, not just coming with ideas, they're coming with solutions to problems. And that's so very important. Uh, it blows our mind and uh, what, what they're actually capable of doing. You know, we have, let's say our winning team from last year, our kids play team, they created an app so that you could find um, I guess, uh, parks that were friendly to people, to kids of different, different abilities, I guess. And there were so few of them in Queensland that actually say, you know, how many abilities they have and, and who they suit. Um, so they created an app. So, you know, if you have, you need a fence or you need certain things, you can actually look this app up. And these are 10, 11 year olds who are creating this app. 
they were for a year on their project. They, they weren't even allowed to enter the program because they were too young. The teacher said, no, I'll come back next year. So they were for a whole year on it. Uh, they, you know, writing a 50 page business plan to support the work that they're doing. Oh, and yeah, it's something that is, you know, one of their siblings, it, it's about their sibling and that's, it solves a problem for them and their family. And that's where these ideas are coming from and solutions are coming from. It's just totally mind blowing. So I think, I think what we're seeing uh, and digital literacy and, and the digital divide, I just did a recent research project on what is the digital divide now. And I think that's still very relevant, particularly where, you know, working from home, we're delivering this online. Um, the digital divide still exists from where it was maybe 20 years ago. It's just shifted. And now people generally do have access to technology and access to an internet connection and access was always that first, you know, the have and the haves not. Uh, however, what their access is, is pretty intermittent. You know, they don't necessarily have good devices. You know, let's learn from home. We might have four children. I don't have four devices that are capable. I have mm -hmm. people, you know, working email on their phones. Um, you know, it's, it's crazy. So, and let's not talk about the security around mm -hmm. all of those things and how bad that, that actually is um, at the moment. So I think young people are definitely more literate we're finding our girls are just able to troubleshoot just like this. And that's one of the things we found around digital literacy. It basically is an ability to troubleshoot and an ability to find authoritative sources on things. And they're the two things that I guess seem to be the haves and haves nots now. So I think things are definitely changing, but then you've got young people who are completely disengaged as well. So, I mean, we can't talk for everyone, but we need young people to be, they, these are just essential skills of the future alongside maths and English literacy. They need digital literacy. One of the things I probably enjoyed the most of last year is what a privilege it was to sit and watch Riley learn. So Riley is my stepdaughter's 10. And like most parents pre-COVID, you know, we dropped off at school and picked up at the end of the day and how was school and all of those usual conversations. But actually having her around the house, you just got to see how her brain worked and how quickly she picked up things and, and how digitally literate she was. Like she just took to homeschooling like a duck to water and um, was, you know, recording videos and making movies to talk, you know, to explain her projects and all of these sort of things. And yeah, it was just a real eye-opening for me on just how how things have evolved, not because of COVID, but, it, but particularly last year, it, it accelerated my awareness of, of certainly what had happened, what's happened in the 20 years since I was taught. <laughs> about IT but when um, there's a lot of conversations obviously about um, digitization and the future of tech and the future of work at the moment and we've had a lot of them at VID as well and a lot of it feels like a lot of the conversations are being led by people like us not the generations that are coming afterwards that may have more or are likely to have in fact more digital literacy than even we do so what are you seeing in that in that neck of the woods yeah that's really interesting uh, and i've been asking the question a lot in terms of particularly again what's happening in the country at the moment around equity um asking what parents what do their their daughters particularly like how are they reacting what do they care about right now mm. and yes they care about what's going on but as i'm, I'm sure they're putting in the too hard basket which you know which <laughs> is an obvious thing to do but they actually really care about the environment and how much we've screwed up this world our generation and they are determined to fix it. And I'm feeling so grateful that there's this perspective out there from them at the moment. And they care on levels that I don't think we can really understand, which I think is amazing. And I know like we have so many teams in our competition who, you know, create apps to solve problems around the environment. Like we have our PQ team, the plastic pollution preventers. Um, again, 10, I think they were nine and 10 when they first entered the competition. Um, they created an app to essentially help us track our single use plastic use. Uh, really interesting story around that. So one of the students in the program, um, her mother suggested she be in the program when she was nine. Her sister had been in it and she said, no, I don't want to do that because I won't be good at it. Mm. That was her response at nine. Oh, so not that I don't want to try it, I won't be good at it. So she basically opted herself out of that STEM journey very, very early. Fortunately, her mother was very persistent uh, and suggested she join and get some friends, which she did. Um, and um, interestingly, they created this, you know, the P-Cubed app and they went on to win the nationals, the state winners, national winners. They beat out like a thousand other girls. They went to Silicon Valley when they were 10 and 11. 
you know, dropping business cards on people's desks as they're walking past. <laughs> they're pitching to, you know, top venture capitalists over there who were just amazed at the research they'd done. These girls had a song, you know, um, that actually was um, went along with their app. It was um, an adaptation of another song that their music teacher helped them with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've been presenting in Parliament. They, they created what's called Rapper Free Wednesday at their school. So they said every Wednesday, try not to bring rappers in your lunchbox and let's, you know, save the environment. They're out collecting rubbish. Like these girls are truly amazing. And we were fortunate for International Women's Day just recently to have um, the Minister for Women here in, in Queensland, who's also the Attorney General, um, come for International Women's Day. And our girls presented to her and just watching these girls grow up um, now that here we are two, three years later. Um, it's truly beautiful on so many levels to see the confidence they have what they care about and I mean it was always there but it was I guess the competition in our program is a way to show them what's possible and extract that out of them in a way and there's some really interesting research that says um I can give you an example I met the researcher in China a couple of years ago the last conference I went to again remember when we used to travel um it was a thing and she was doing research on her computer science students um and in the U.S. And she asked them, she said, okay, to, um, why are you studying computer science? 80% of the men said they were studying it because uh, they like computer science. Makes sense. 80% of the women said they were studying it because they were invited to. Mm -hmm. No one reached out to them and said, you should do this. You'd be good at this. And I guess that's what um, our young person, um, tech girl, her mother did, reached out to her, invited her a number of occasions, or she wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. And think about how many girls are not getting this you know great experience of you know realizing their potential because they just go i'm not going to be good at it or well, i'm yeah I, I know this with conversations with riley and as well as sort of like when you, when you're the only one or i can't see my friends doing it or i can't see other girls doing it not necessarily girls actually whether it's whether her friends are involved or not and as soon as that sort of starts to happen or she's invited yeah it's the doors like the doors cracked and she'll walk she'll walk through i've seen that already um, at 10 and yeah, it's something I'm I'm very aware of and I look back through my career and there's been many times where I've been invited to to go and explore different parts and you go well if those invitations hadn't been there would I would I have stepped through the door and I think the answer probably would have been been no so I'm not I'm not surprised and I think the I um did a talk for International Women's Day um for a, a group uh for an IT group in for CIO in an Asia organization and we were talking about um, what is tech and certainly when I started tech was sort of seen as cables and boxes whereas now tech can go everything from you know application layer to you know app design and it can actually be quite creative um, and very human oriented at one end of the spectrum to to what I no, which is you know calling under desks and running cables, which is where I started. Um, do you find that 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 conversation is playing out as well? It's a really interesting one, I think, um, because often people are tempted to put an A in STEM to make it STEAM, which I think is a fascinating conversation, and I love having this conversation. Um, uh, I'm of the I'm of the thought that. STEM in itself is creative. So my background's in tech. Tech is absolutely creative when done well. Uh, you know, creating a, an el elegant algorithm, you know, that, that's a pretty special thing to be able to do and takes a lot of creativity, I would say. Um, uh, and, you know, the, not even talking about design, but um, so I think it, it lessens what's already there by adding an A in and assumes it's not there. And mm -hmm. then we start adding all sorts of other letters. I've seen many different letters being added and nothing to discredit them. I understand they probably want to jump on the STEM sort of idea but I'd like to probably reframe that and what I like to think about is like STEM plus X so I'd like to ask what is your X factor so what do you like what do you care about is it animals is it the environment um you know is it making is sustainability or making cars better is it like what is it you care about and then how do you add STEM to that I think that's a perfect combination. Then you don't have to choose STEM or other things. It's actually STEM is embedded in everything that we do. So it's about what is that thing you love? How can you make STEM part of that? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I look at science, technology, engineering and maths and I go, they're all solutions to something, all, all ways of solving bigger problems. So what's the, what's the bigger problem um, that, you, that you're passionate about? And uh, I think that's a great way of reframing it, it could quite easily become lots of things, steam, stream, you, know, you name it. So uh, <laughs> I love that. Um, what do you think about, um, as we think about 
Uh, we've had a lot of conversations through Biz, particularly around uh, including young people and in particular creating policies that represent all generations, making sure that we've got the right people in the room, so we've got the representation in the conversation. Um, Are you asking me about quotas, Julia? <laughs> no, I can drop the quote. I can drop the keyword if we want to talk about. No, quotas. no, we can, um, go, we can go there. <laughs> I, I think it's not as offensive as it, it comes across to a lot of people. Um, I think it means, oh, we have rules around things, but you know, those rules probably should be there. And I guess my argument is we have a pretty extreme situation in the lack of women and young people, young people in general coming into STEM. We have a massive skill shortage on so many levels and women are being left behind. There's a great UNESCO report called I Blush If I Could, which is a sad but realistic view of what's happening in the world with um, women's access to digital technology at the moment and creating digital technology. And so I think that's a very real conversation we need to have. And, you know, yeah, again, we're in a situation where we need the brightest minds to take our world forward now more than ever, um, particularly digitally. And if we're missing out on them because they just say, I'm not going to be good at it. And, you know, she's school captain and amazing in so many different ways and not just academically, but we find that our tech girls are very talented in so many different areas. You know, they're musicians, they're, you know, doing karate, they're doing incredible things. So, and, that, and that in, in one way, that's part of the problem is that we get them coming through our program and they are so talented at so many things, they have so many options. Mm -hmm. And so to get them to do STEM is a challenge. And so that is one of the issues we have. And I know I, I can give Cher a really nice example. Oh, I have someone playing games outside. If you need to reach out the door, let me know. Um, they're playing soccer um, next to the park. But a really exa great example of that recently is Kira. So Kira came through the program, I think she was in year eight at the time um, from WA. And the, the program, our tech girls 12 week competition was part of her, a subject that she did for digital technologies at school. So she was kind of made to do it. Um, so before this, Kira um, wanted to be a doctor. Said on that was all she ever wanted to do. She did our program, uh, her and her team created an app to essentially gamify preparing for NAPLAN. So I guess, you know, NAPLAN was pretty boring to get prepared for. So they said, let's make some games. And it was really fun. And so they, they won the WA, um, you know, finals one year. Then they won the nationals the next year. They came to Silicon Valley and pitched over there and did an incredible job. Uh, I think at some point they had like 5,000 downloads of their app on the Google Play Store. So everyone in their school was using it. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, so since then, um, Kira has now gone to university. So she's at University at WA. I think she may have got a scholarship to get in. Um, she decided to do technology and medicine because she could make more of an impact, um, basically because of our program. In her first year, she did a project on breast cancer screening technology, and she won the best undergraduate computer science project in all of Australia in her first year. Um, she, we've got this great video. She talks about how she's had mentor, her mentor really helped her, but she basically puts it back to our program and how just it's helped her just to show that she can do anything and make an impact. And uh, she did this great video for us for International Women's Day. And it's just incredible to see, you know, it's come full circle. It's taken eight years to get here. We're in our eighth year. And this tiny idea that I had that was kind of just a passion more than anything um, and managed to turn it into something legitimate. And um, you know, I have what, 15, I think 14, 15 staff now and um, working part time and it's, it's fabulous. I have a dream team, I have a dream job. I get to do the stuff I care about. It's just incredible. And then, you know, and it's working and talking to these girls, it's like, oh, you're proof I had one good idea once and that's all I ever need to do in life. Yeah, I know um, I was, talking at the when I was talking at this CIO event I mentioned earlier it's like we seem to have gone from technology being I'm, and I'm talking specifically with technology but it's the same with engineering and and the other areas as well whereas we've gone from technology being this vertical to almost it being a horizontal and you can go well it doesn't matter whether you're in marketing or finance or HR or medicine or accounting or hairdressing it doesn't really matter what you where you go the technology understanding technology is going to give you access to so many more more things and you'll be able to solve so many more more problems and uh even even so riley is a massive gamer like i love how much she games she, she's just like a, a part of me wants to tell her not to play so so many games but i love that she's playing them that i don't, I don't want to say stop but she'll she she'll look at She's always wanted to be a writer when she grows up. She says, you want to be an author? And I thought, well, how do you, how do you think they write games? 
and you saw it in Sony all the time, then she's like, oh, okay, but you're just disconnecting those dots between um, what we would say is, you know, traditional roles and, and not getting stuck in lanes or job, job titles, I think is really healthy at that age as well. Who, who knows where it's going to go? But do you think um, when you look at, like a lot's been talked about the future of tech and AI and, and other things, do you think that, um, do you think, the, how do we get that to play out in a way where they, it's not about quotas and it is about um, inclusion and that we're not, you know, programming bias into into technology and we how do we how do we do that? It's a really great question, and the first thing that comes to mind is that we need to create inclusive design yeah. of technology. And again, I've got kids in the park, so if you need me to, it's kind of nice. On the it is nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they're enjoying the park um yeah I, and this comes back i i've been doing research on human-centered you know um hci like um yeah human-centered inter design and interaction for 17 years kind of thing and i went to, when we were in silicon valley not too long ago it was like these companies were starting to pick up this thing called like um hci and i was like great but you're a bit late, but great, nonetheless. Um, we do this for a while. But I think that's it. It's about putting the human at the centre of what we do. And if you think of, you know, our biggest tech failures in Australia recently, if you think of something like RoboDebt, um, you know, obviously there were no humans involved and how many people's lives did that just shatter? And just putting a couple of humans in there to, you know, manage the process, the census, you know, there's been a number of examples where just having people, and again, it comes back to this idea of people that we talked about earlier, that's what got us interested. And you can't forget the people, computers are only so good as the people behind them and um, I just finished reading this amazing book and I shared it with my book club we had great conversations last week called Smart Wives and it's about our digital home assistants so our series and our Alexas and things and how they need a bit of a feminist reboot and um, because there's so much bias that are built into them from so many different levels and not just the way we talk to them in that we don't say please and thank you you know we treat them like a slave and it's a woman's voice and that unconsciously does put certain you know um it reinforces certain values um traditionally they were supposed to i guess help women around the house or help relieve sort of that unpaid work and in a lot, a lot of ways it's created a lot more work for men and women because now men have to maintain these systems um there's a lot of issues around them in terms of you know privacy and security of people you know spying on former partners and things like that which is a whole new weapon to make vulnerable people vulnerable people more vulnerable so again that double-edged sword and there's just so many possibilities but we have to be very careful and, and who we have designing these systems going forward and there's certainly not enough women um I've been talking around cyber security and those in that in the last week and again there's just not enough women you know talking to to people who run companies they simply just don't have any women on their staff mm. and I realize it's hard to do but firstly they can increase their profits for up to 35 percent by actually having a CEO you know in their team that in itself is a bit of a no-brainer but you need that diversity of thought we need you know if we all look the same we all think the same how boring is that and we don't get innovation from that yeah I um I don't believe that it's hard to find women in tech. I think you, I think it's it's hard if you want to make it hard. Um, that would be a controversial comment for for some, but yeah, if you're willing to actually, was it the University of California in Berkeley? I think changed their the title of their computer science program, um, from the you know systemic programming or something particularly left brain particularly boring or to, to women at least to the joy of the joy of programming something along those lines and you know in just by changing the name radically changed their intake and the people that were interested in it and I think it, it, it just it extends to it extends to you know the jobs that people apply for and what teams look like and and uh, people need to lead need to lead the change um I, and i think saying that you can't find them is is an easy answer you just haven't looked hard enough or gone wide enough or be willing to pay enough or insert whatever reason anyway i'll get off my soapbox on that one. no i completely agree it's a bit of a cop-out and i think there's yeah. definitely you know choose to challenge that's you know what we're all about this year and yeah. i agree um we can help you do that uh, we can help you find the people we we have them and they're 
you know, especially now, the amount of women who've lost their jobs in the last 12 months mm. because of COVID. Um, and, and you know what? My advice is hire mums. <laughs> I love hiring mums because they get stuff done. You know, they come to work, they've got stuff to do, they get it done, they leave and they move on and it's perfect. So, um, yeah, I, I just love that as advice. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a full-time role. You can do job sharing and there's so many possibilities. All of our stuff, you know, pretty much a, a part-time um, um, other than one, but it works perfectly. It's just great to work when it works for you. So the women are out there maybe just not in the way that people want to hire them like it has to be a full-time role it has to be you know that's you have stuff. To come to the office you have to be able to sit here and do this and you have to be able to you know we've got a code drop every fortnight and you need to be working late and that it just doesn't need to be doesn't need to be work it doesn't need to be like that um not necessary now not necessarily now and i think if you are willing to open your mind and open your doors you, you can find women anywhere particularly after last year um, where you, you can, I have worked with a woman who did um, some freelance work with me. She was in the Philippines. I had worked with someone else that they're in Chile because I wanted some video, you know, some video editing, and I've done website design with someone that's in WA. And they don't all need to be sitting, you know, only to be sitting here um, next to me to be able to do that, which is which is wonderful. Do you think? Um, so if we go if we go to the future and particularly some of the um, what's the word sort of stereotypes around millennials are like this and then Zs are going to be or Zs depending on which part of the world you're from are going to be even worse and they you know not going to you know all of the reasons not to hire them or like them or won't even want to talk to them um, because they're different. I love a label, not. <laughs> um, what can, what can we do to, to break down some of these god awful stereotypes? Yeah, there's some really interesting work around competitive advantage for companies now and how do you hire the best people? And just to put a label on something, there's a concept called neurodiversity, I guess, mm -hmm. which looks at, I guess, people with differing abil abilities than we would have traditionally, I guess, valued and measured. And I love the concept because I think yeah, it's about bringing different things to the role. And, you know, one of my best examples, well, you know, my favorite examples is say, um, you know, Dr. Genevieve Bell, who's at ANU, she was hired by IBM as a cultural anthropologist. And her PhD was essentially about looking in people's car boots to understand um, about the, about you, which I think is fascinating. Um, you know, hired into a top tech company was most of one most successful, you know, employees ever. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be in tech, it's about understanding people again, and understanding life and, and how technology fits into that. So, so um, I think the future's the future's very bright. Uh, the future's exciting in the digital space. And again, if nothing else, in the last twelve months we've proven we can kind of do anything. Um, and I think that's going to just um, grow. And I guess coming into this, I had a stat that I would always talk about around digital literacy of young people and how I've got something like you know only sixty percent of I think it was year six and year 10 students are barely digitally literate so that was sort of about three or four years ago and i guess the idea is yeah they might be able to use technology but they can't really get beyond an app and they don't know how to do a budget in a spreadsheet or reply to emails properly and you know those basic digital literacy skills so but i would actually say that's changed and i'm really interested to see what the coming reports will be like in terms of what does digital literacy look like now because i think what's happened it's pushed everyone forward. And so I think young people particularly are gonna benefit from that, I hope, in terms of those basic skills that they just suddenly have, because they've had to. They just had to fumble their way through it and learn things like we all have. But I think mm -hmm. profoundly for them, they needed it more than probably us. Um, so I think that's a really positive thing to look out for. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly know things like where I might used to spend heaps of time talking to my friends on the phone, Riley's online most of the time and rather than writing there might be a video that's created and it's really interesting how some things have some things have shifted and and you know the YouTube channels and the you know it's all people look at some people look at it and go well, you know it's social media and like well actually no there, there is a creative part to it is a technology there's a technology part to it there's a maths part to it like she's written a business case for an idea that she's done. And so there is, you can't do one without the leadership component that you mentioned earlier. And, and whether the whether the girls go into technology or STEM or whether they just become great leaders with an understanding of it, which kind of, it doesn't, it's a win-win situation as far as I can see. Um, ideally we want them to go into STEM, 
but even if they become great leaders, we need more women there anyway. So um, if, they're, if they're leaders and, they're, and they've got a technology background, I'm, I'm, I'm all up for that. Well, that's our secret plan, Julia. That's it. It's like STEM's pretty much everywhere um, and, you know, becoming more pervasive. So we're going to get them regardless. So it's not anymore about having to go into STEM per se. It's about that X. What's your X? And then how do we add that in? Because, yeah, we're going to get them all. And a funny comment that young, some young people have said to me, it's like, oh, I don't want to go into tech because I have to sit in front of a computer all day. It's like, you do realise pretty much everyone who's not in tech does that too. Uh, it's not just a tech thing anymore. So. Yeah. It's funny that, yeah. Not you, get, you just get to use the tech that the people in tech designed for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny view. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a good, just point of view. And so, um, obviously, tech girls are superheroes. They're still rolling. Um, if people are listening to this live or the recording, they know a young girl who's, you know, got an interest or a, a, a spark of a problem that they're passionate about what what should they do i love it thank you for the invitation that's right so this is tech girls movement tech girls um, dot org um, you can reach out to us and um yeah so essentially we run a, a 12 week stem entrepreneurship program for girls from 7 to 17 across australia and new zealand we launch on international women's day on the 8th of march and we run our program each year from uh from may to july so that's in term two of our schools here in australia um, the idea of that and um, is to, I guess, um, get girls together to find problems they care about in their local community. And it's really about young people solving young people's problems. So it's about girls getting together a team, finding a problem in their local community they want to solve, and then um, brainstorming and, and seeing how other people have tried to solve the problems that they're interested in. Once they choose a problem that they all care about, they then, you know, they have to do feasibility studies and they do SWOT analyses and all these very cool things that I used to teach at university and now we have like nine-year-olds doing them. <laughs> and um, they then have to come up with a solution to a problem. So they essentially design it in the form of a wireframe for an app and then they have to build a working prototype of the app and they build a business plan then they have to pitch it. So they do that all in 12 weeks. So it's pretty incredible that we have, um, you know, like 50, uh, 50 page business plans being produced by our 10 year olds. Um, and it's truly mind blowing the amount of research and detail that goes into their solutions. You know, we have industry judges like yourself. So by all means, we're at the moment calling for mentors. I guess the two things that work about the program is that it's young people solving young people's problems, but also we match every team of girls with a female mentor like yourself um, to essentially just be someone as a, a you know signposting to them and say, look, I can do it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And it's important and we need you and you're important. And there's something really profound we've found for young girls, particularly to have an adult they don't know, take them seriously and take their ideas seriously. So that's a really powerful part of what we do. And our mentors love it. They say, you know, it's the best thing that I did last year. And <laughs> so we're expecting about 2000 girls in the, the competition. And um, that means we have a few hundred mentors and they're all coming in at the moment. So by all means, we still have time for you to register if you're watching this any time before so, um, end of uh, April. We'd love to hear from you and um, only female mentors, but we do open up for men to come and join us for judging uh, in August. So again, you can follow our social and we'll do a shout out for you. Um, so yeah, we give real world feedback to our teams. And so again, they, you know, and then we have our state and national winners. It's, it's such an incredible experience to be part of, to see, what young people care about you know and we supplement these with online workshops and we're going back face to face i was supposed to be at the school two days ago but of course we were in lockdown in brisbane but we're back face to face in schools and just again seeing what solutions or what problems they care about in the community that they're in which varies you know regional to urban um different parts of the country and you know the teachers like oh i'm not sure if they can do this and the girls like yeah we can do this we're gonna do this and they do. Yeah. Of course I can do it. <laughs> well, incredible, you know, solutions and problems that, you know, we've never really thought about. So it's just truly beautiful to see. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm.